Welcome to the Zoe Routh Leadership Podcast, where we explore the future and what this means for your leadership. We ask the big questions. What's happening on the horizon? What does this mean for us? And most importantly, what skills do I need now for leadership of the future? It's time to explore. Let's go. Hey, it's Zoe, your friendly neighborhood Canadian Australian leadership futurist. And on the show, I am really committed to helping big thinkers with big hearts make a big difference. We are looking at the future, what's happening, and what this means for our leadership. Today's guest, his name is Rohit Bhargava, and he is an entrepreneur, a listener, a speaker, an author, and professional trend curator. He is the founder and chief trend curator at the Non-Obvious Company. He is the adjunct professor of marketing and storytelling at Georgetown University. He is the founder and author of Idea Press Publishing and the co-author of an amazing book called The Future Normal, How We Will Live, Work, and Thrive in the Next Decade. He calls it a handbook for visionaries. And it is awesome. <laughs> I've reviewed it on a number of different platforms, and I was delighted that Rohit agreed to come on the show. And today we talk about some really powerful trends that are emerging. And most importantly, what we need as leaders in terms of our mindset, our values, our beliefs, and our habits in order to meet it head on and to make the most of it in a powerful, ethical, and inclusive way. Let's get into it. Woohoo! All the way from just outside Washington, D.C. Welcome to the show, Rohit Bhargava. Oh, thank you so much. I'm very excited to talk to you. Absolutely. Your book, The Future Normal, which you co-authored, is fantastic. Before we get into the juicy detail of that, which is all about trends and what's happening in the future that is emerging now, I would love to know how you ended up in this field of work. What's your origin story? Uh, well, I have always been a writer. And I came from the world of marketing and advertising. And I think that I started writing about trends and I found that people were really excited and interested in it. Uh, and that's what kind of led me down this path to become now what I call a reluctant futurist, <laughs> oh. uh, where I write about the future, but uh, but I don't put myself in the same category as many futurists who just do this work only. So reluctant because it's not your full gig or tell me a little bit why you feel reluctant? <laughs> Well, I think because a lot of times when people picture or imagine a futurist, they think of somebody who's going to tell you what's going to happen in 2050. And the lens that I often write about and what I what I think about is what's going to happen in the next few years. And so the reluctance is that I'm not focused on the far future, I'm focused on the near future. So the joke that my co-author and I sort of started sharing in a lot of our talks was that we were near futurists. And that's also way more reliable in terms of predictions. Like we can sort of figure <laughs> out in the next couple of years what is likely to occur. And it gets way more vague and fuzzy the further out we go. So, you know, reluctance, well earned, <laughs> well selected, I guess. Um, well, thank you. Yeah. So from marketing to trends to like, and it's all like really exciting stuff. And there's amazing stories in your book. Why did you call it the future normal? I think we wanted to put two words that don't typically belong together. And I love the juxtaposition of that as an English major, a former English major, but also because of the message that it sends. Because many times when we think about the future, we think about these really hugely technological things. And there's all these cliches about the future being unevenly distributed, which is kind of true. Some people have the future and some people don't. Some people can afford things, some people can't. Some people live in a place that is more future oriented and some people don't. And normal to us was what is going to happen for everyone? What is going to be available for everyone? And it leveled the playing field in a way that we really loved as a concept. And that's what we wanted to try and write about, a more inclusive way of thinking about the future. Mm, that's really powerful. Can you give us an example of something that is going to be equitable and available to all that's happening in the next couple of years? I think that learning took a huge leap forward out of necessity because of the pandemic. And if you think about the idea of online learning, it was always kind of around. I mean, not always, but for a long time. But it was not mainstream. 
Uh, it was not something that everyone had to do until all of a sudden during the pandemic, you had people across the world who had to totally transform overnight into learning online. And many people didn't like it, <laughs> and it created a lot of issues for a lot of people, but it moved forward. And I think that now this idea that there is access to some of the world's smartest people and the ability to learn from those people that is at the fingertips of anyone who has Wi-Fi is amazing. And that may have been the case before, but it's moved hugely forward. And that's what I think is really exciting about that one thing in particular. So it's more accessible. We can get a hold of this tech. We can learn things online more easily. And yet not everybody can actually do that because I know there was lots of stories during the pandemic here in Australia where a lot of kids were being left behind because they didn't have internet at home and they didn't have laptops, etc. So it's like, oh, learn from home. And these kids are like, I can't. <laughs> How am I going to do that? Yeah. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, I think that we're we're still going to have those types of challenges. Not everyone, like I said, not everybody has Wi-Fi. Not everyone has access to the internet at home. And during the pandemic, you were really stuck at home. Like you didn't really have the alternative options that uh, that you might have had otherwise when you could go to a library or some other place. But I think that it's getting better. And I think that it's getting more ubiquitous for people. And I think that we're realizing that whether you access the web through a computer or whether it's just a mobile device and you're accessing it that way, that access is happening for more and more people. And it's happening uh, cheaper and cheaper. I wish the same could be true of healthcare. If healthcare was dropping in cost the same way that cost of technology and access was, then we'd actually achieve a lot more abundance more quickly. But that's a side issue. <laughs> yeah. And it's a, definitely a challenge that we need to resolve. And one of the things I like a lot about your book is how the trends and stories that you pick are about people who've been thinking about the problems that are facing humans and how can we solve those within the principles of regenerative agriculture, regenerative resource use, etc. The other thing you link in there is how successful innovations will probably rise to the fore and become future normal because they address certain human needs. And the ones that you list in the book are identity, connection, self-improvement, and status. And you also put in there, and others. I'm like, what are the others? <laughs> so when we're talking about human needs, is there a specific model you went to to identify those needs? Or how do you specifically think about human needs and how future developments will serve those? I think the place that we started is by looking at perhaps technology or products or stories that seemed really intriguing and trying to find the essence of what the human value was that they were addressing, Okay, uh, the human need that they were addressing. I don't know that anyone needs to really build an expertise in human needs beyond just being human themselves. I mean, we all kind of know what we need as individuals. And so sometimes these topics are deeply personal because we understand them as, as just people. So here's an example. We wrote two chapters that were meant to sort of sit as a duo and kind of did because one was after the other. And they were both addressing loneliness, which is a huge human topic that a lot of people are dealing with and talking about now. And the first chapter talked about ending loneliness through a really unique living arrangement that many places around the world are trying where they take intergenerational living. So people who are older and have them living in the same place as people who are younger and they help one another and they communicate with one another and they create a community around that. And the second chapter was called Virtual Companionship. And it took a more technological concept of addressing loneliness through virtual companions, having relationships with machines, and something that many people are really afraid of, that we will potentially start falling in love with computers and not with each other. And we addressed some of those challenges and concerns, but also talked about how perhaps technology created in these very human ways to interact with us in a counseling sort of situation could be the exact way that we want technology to be, which is humanly built with emotional intelligence at its core, not cold, logical, and calculating. 
which is what most dystopian fiction, science fiction, presents technology as becoming when it decides to wipe us out. Mm. I love both those stories, and there's so much to unpack around them. The whole idea of, um, first of all, technology that becomes our companions, I, I can really see how that can occur. And certainly the, the movies that we've seen, her, um, as an example, really showcases a man falling in love with his operating system. And um, that's an example of how, and even talking to chat GPT, and I didn't want to call the chat chat GPT, so I said, what's your name? He's like, I don't have a name. You can just call me AI. I'm like, well, that's boring. Uh, I said, and then I asked it, well, if you were writing as Zoe Routh, what would Zoe Routh call you? And he came back with some sort of like a stellar interstellar communicator or something. I'm like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> cosmic counselor. That's what he came up with, cosmic counselor. And I'm like, hmm. I don't think I would call you Cosmic Counselor, but I would call you Cecil. So I started caling ChatGPT3 Cecil, and it feels like a conversation. And <laughs> I feel like I have a personal advisor now with my ChatGPT, and they resp- it, it responds as Cecil when I refer to it as Cecil. And you can feel like you are developing a relationship with this entity. Uh, one of the other things that you talk about in the book is – um, I think it was in your book, or maybe it's a case that I read elsewhere. Some of these technologies that had huge promise in aged care, say, for example, uh, robotic companions. And at first they were a godsend and a lot of the practitioners really enjoyed them. And then they noticed that the residents would get jealous if other people were using the electronic companions, like these little shaggy dogs or whatever, <laughs> and they got proprietary around them. So they did create some prop, like human problems. You know, I don't want to share my little electronic pet with others. So these are examples of how some of the human needs can be met and they still have to address all the human needs as a, as a cluster, not just one. Coming back to the first example that you gave where you had old people living with young people. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Is that a community design thing? Is that like established? Yeah. Okay. Uh, there. So there are a few of them around the world. The one that we wrote about was a Swedish group. I think it was called um, Salbo or something along those lines. And the idea was that you would take people who were uh, older and you would take people who are younger. And they also had some refugees coming in uh, and living in these communities. And they basically put people – unusual people together and made it a part of the requirement of living there that they would spend a certain amount of time as part of the community, either playing board games or communicating with one another or having a meal together. And as a result of that, they found that the overall happiness that people had at feeling these social connections and these things that oftentimes we feel are missing was hugely beneficial because, I mean, anybody who's read about loneliness or studied loneliness knows it's not – loneliness doesn't come from being alone. Loneliness can be happen if even if you're surrounded by people. Loneliness comes from not feeling a social connection to the people that are around you. And so I could be in the middle of a crowd and feel hugely lonely, right? It's not about being in a cabin alone <laughs> and now I'm lonely. In fact, sometimes that solitude makes you feel more connected. So – We have to understand better what loneliness really is and and why it's so damaging because several people have now written about how it's it's perhaps the major health concern for people as they get older, not the conditions or the diseases that we are afraid of having, but the crippling effects of loneliness. I agree with that. And certainly we saw it during the pandemic, how much it affected uh, different people who the isolation was the, the loneliness factor was a far greater impact than any of the medical conditions that came as a result of, of getting sick. And it's interesting how you raise this for some as, people, yeah, for some people, yeah. not for everybody. Yeah. You're right, but for a large, for a lot of people, it was. It's. I'm thinking about my own family and how the loneliness factor from the social isolation really impacted their health. And it's interesting to see how these very personal um, issues social issues have arisen as a result of technological advances in some ways. It's the communities or the society that we're creating has these side effects that we didn't intend. And it's an, it's a new challenge that we need to solve for. Are you seeing other trends that are trying to solve this apart from the community design and uh, the, the AI 
type of figures that are trying to solve some of this loneliness? Anything else that's on the radar? Sure. I mean, how much how much time do we have? <laughs> the book, as you know, is uh, is it paints a picture of thirty trends that that we feel are are really shaping the future, shaping the future normal that we wrote about. And some of them talk about loneliness. We also talked about identity, uh, which I think was a really interesting space. And one of the chapters that we uh, we talked about, in fact, we opened with it, was something we called multiversal identity. Yeah, that's a really, really interesting one. So please, let's get into that one. Yeah, and the the idea was not that we will have an identity in the multiverse. That wasn't it. Wasn't about the multiverse. <laughs> what it was about was that we have our own identities, and then we have identities that are online. And the identities that we create for ourselves online on different platforms can be different. So who I am on Instagram could be different than who I am on LinkedIn, can be different than who I am on Tinder uh, or a dating profile because I choose different aspects of myself to share. And the management of that shapes my entire identity. And more and more, I think that we as people are going to have to make those sorts of decisions to say, how much of myself do I share in this platform versus that platform? Who do I become? Who do I want to be? How do I want to show up? And these are the sorts of things that young people in particular are, are having to deal with now too. And, and I feel much better today about the state of education for young people on this fact than I would have 10 years ago. I mean, 10 years ago, we were not teaching kids that everything you put online stays online. If you're a bully online or if you're acting in a certain way or if you post certain things about yourself online, like they don't go away. And we need to educate people, especially kids who are just starting to use these technologies. So now we have a different challenge. I mean, the challenge is spending too much time getting addicted to the screen. But there's a lot of education. I mean, I see it with my kids. There's a lot of education for them on what they should or shouldn't post online, how much of themselves they should or shouldn't share online. Because we've figured out that that was a problem and we've started to address it. And it only took us 10 years <laughs> or more <laughs> to, to get there. <laughs> Some so, people were earlier than others, I got to say. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, they saw the limitations or the threats around it. And I think the same conversation is happening right now around artificial intelligence and the need for guardrails around that. In your research, what have you discovered about the impact, potential impacts of AI and what's happening in that space? Well, first of all, I do think that AI is going to hugely impact people's jobs, but maybe not in the way that they imagine. I think that there are definitely some jobs that are under threat. And that's one of the big questions people always ask me, are we going to lose our jobs uh, to AI? And, and the truth is, some people are going to lose their their jobs to AI. So which ones are those? Because if people are automatically be thinking that. Yeah. So what people often, their minds often go to people who are in writing roles, people who are in creative roles, artists, musicians, because that's what gets the most attention. But I don't think those are the industries that are going to be most affected by AI. Uh, if I had to name one industry that's going to be most affected, I would say law and legal, the legal profession. Because the thing is, first of all, nobody likes 26-page contracts except for lawyers. And most of those could be written by robots and, in fact, have that level of personality attached to them <laughs> on purpose. And I think that very quickly people have learned that if you need a contract to be written in a certain style, AI could do it equally well to a lawyer and there's not creativity required and there's not the human touch required or any of the things that we find lacking when we try and get AI to write, say, something else for us. It could be perfectly good at writing a lot of these types of contracts. And so a certain aspect of law, that's not everything. I mean, let many people who have a law degree practice lots of other things besides writing contracts. But that aspect of law is going to be taken over, I think. And so that's under threat. Like if your job is writing contracts, you know, that time is limited for that job to be a job. Hey, it's Zoe. If you're enjoying these leadership insights, join us in the Amplifiers Academy. It's bite-sized leadership development through self-paced videos and exercises, templates, checklists, resources, and an online community to connect with other leaders. It's Amplifiers Academy, your gateway to better, stronger leadership. See you there. 
Thank you for raising that, Rohit. Yeah, my husband's a lawyer, and um, I want to say yes and to what you just shared. He's been experimenting with JetGPT, and he's he said, you know, he's put inquiries in there. Give me a case study on X, you know, situation or X scenario, and it comes back with a report. He's also asked it, tasked it with, can you draft a an intro letter incorporating these couple of uh, dot points and paying it goes. He goes, well, that took me two minutes or less than two minutes. And it would take in half a day for a junior to do that. So he's like, he can see absolute acceleration of efficiencies in that. That's one aspect of it. So the other aspect that is not going to get replaced is the time that he sits with clients who he's a divorce lawyer. He sits with clients talking them down off the emotional cliff of wanting to go into a fight and to help them find rational ways of looking at the situation. That's not being replaced by artificial intelligence. So just go ahead. You know, I mean, just to to react to that, I would say, I mean, I don't know your husband, but if I were to ask him what part of his job does he love, is it sitting down and writing the separation agreement or is it doing exactly what you said, which is helping people get down off that emotional cliff? My guess is he'd probably spent – choose to spend more time doing that and choose to spend as little time as possible sitting there trying to write this agreement. Well, yeah, that's right. Well, that's why he gives it to the juniors. <laughs> it's like you guys, <laughs> and you they are the not notes. doing it because they love to do it, right? They're just doing it because they have to in order to get to his level. So, <laughs> that's exactly you know, no, right. The point is nobody <laughs> wants to do this work, right? Yeah. And so why do we wring our hands and worry about AI taking over this thing that everyone hates to do and becomes a rite of passage in our industry? Why not just teach it how to do it and review the work and spend our time doing something that we actually like better? See, I think that's where we need to invest the energy. And I think um, that's one of the skills that leaders need to really hone in themselves and others is this creative thinking piece, which is all about if we were liberated from this drudgery of work, what then? What we, what might we apply our energy and time to? Yeah, and I think the fear is not so much that. I think the fear is that people outside of, for example, the legal profession will discover that they can use this tool to do this and therefore will think, oh, I don't need the experts to do this sort of stuff. I could just slap it together myself with ChatGPT. <laughs> I think that's the, the same fear mongering that's happening in the author world. You know, there's going to be this tsunami of crap where people are just producing books with this. And yes, and <laughs> yes, and no. There's already a tsunami of crap, and and I would argue that what caused it much more than than AI writing books is the ease of publishing and distributing them, which is mostly because of Amazon, because now those books can go out and people can have to navigate through. I mean, if you're looking for a book on a certain topic on Amazon, there's a lot of crap that you have to go through to find a halfway decent book because anyone can publish and post and on Amazon, it has a thumbnail. It looks completely equivalent to a book that had a lot of work go into it. And there's no quality check apart from, are there any typos or like a very basic stuff? And, uh, and that's the challenge. Well, actually, I think it circles back to the whole conversation around human needs. If you're going to buy a book or see a lawyer, what do you want? If you're buying a book, you want to have a good experience and entertaining, uplifting and uh, growth experience of it. So the books that are crap will soon pay the consequence for a badly produced book by its ratings. And same thing with doing your legalese. If you just get your advice from chat GPT, what are you missing? You're missing the A, the interpersonal connection with your lawyer and B, actually what is the most important part is the strategy piece of what is the way that you're going to go about putting forward your case, whether it's a family law matter or some other matter. And those are things that cannot be picked up by artificial intelligence. And I don't think they will be picked up in the future. You know, I think there's still going to be, yeah. when you're looking at writing, it's going to be the human creativity, the nuance, the uniqueness of it that is going to put it ahead uh, as opposed to just the generic production. Now you were going to say something, go for it. Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, we have to remember when we're using a tool like AI to remember what it's actually good at. So generative AI is good at generating content based on prompts. The problem is that now what people are starting to realize is what I think is now widely being called AI hallucination, which is the idea that if it can generate all of the text for you, for example, for an essay, if you're a student trying to use it in that way, 
it'll also generate the sources for you. And the sources it will generate will seem like they are real sources. So for example, if you're writing an essay and you're trying to quote me as an author who's written about trends, ChatGPT could come up with a quote, attribute it to me, who's a real person, attribute it to me from my book and get the title of the book right, which is a real book, but it'll make up the page number and it'll make up the quote. So (laughs) it's hallucinating that that quote happened, but the person behind the quote and the book behind the quote are real. So it's really difficult now because you're looking at something that's generated and it's totally fake and it's incorrect, but it seems like it could be real because it's quoting a real person in a real book. And the the knowledge required to then use that tool, but not use it in a way that causes all of these wrong things or, or not factual things to come through requires a level of education, right? We have to understand how to use the tools. And so that's what I talk to my kids about when they're using chat GPT for various things to do research or to, to write various things for them, know what it's doing and know how it works. I think that's a really useful point. And I had that experience too, where I asked it for, you know, web links to support the statement that I just made. And I went and clicked on it, all the five links it provided. They were all fake links. <laughs> they didn't go anywhere. I'm like, really? You know, that's, um, <laughs> right. It's like you meet those humans who want to give you an answer no matter what, even though it's totally made up. And there's some cultures that are like that too. And they don't want to say no to anyone. So they will just make up something because they want to give you something. <laughs> and I don't think yeah. it's malintentioned. They're not trying to derail you. They just feel social pressure to answer something as opposed to saying, I don't know. Or Right. They don't, they won't say, I don't know. They'll, um, they'll nod along or, or yeah. Yeah. So sure. it, it's I, a little I've bit like that, I think. <laughs> so on innovations, what is the innovation that you are most excited about and why? Oh, that's a tough one because there's so many things that are exciting that we discovered or that we wrote about. One thing I think that gave me a lot of hope is we wrote a chapter called Waste Free Products. And it's pretty much in the title. You could tell what that's about. And just the idea that we could have these products and use them in a way that would not negatively impact the environment and not have to give up something in order to do that, I think is, is a really powerful message because so much of conservation is you take a shorter shower, you know, it's like, it's give something up because it's important. And that also is required. I mean, that's not a a bad way of positioning it, but if you could do it in a different way and say, for example, there's a company that makes glitter uh, that is biodegradable. And glitter is, I mean, if you're using glitter, you're doing something fun, right? Glitter is for fun. It's for parties. It's for yeah, something that that's cool. And the problem is glitter is basically microplastic, which we know is bad. And this is not even plastic that has to break down. This is microplastic when you buy it. And if we could buy biodegradable glitter, then we could solve that problem and not give up our fun. And that exists. Biodegradable glitter exists. And so... When I talk about this, I say to people, look, you can think about the future and the changes we need to make it for the future in a big picture way and say, we need to clean up all the plastic in the ocean. Or you could just spend an extra 53 cents and buy glitter <laughs> that is biodegradable. Like you tell me what is what is reasonable to do, right? And I think that the role that we saw for ourselves with this book was to tell the stories of people like that, doing things like that. Because the more we know about those things, the more we can choose those items. I mean, there's an entire category of of shoe manufacturers that are either recycling or upcycling all the materials for sneakers. Or there's one pair of sneakers that we actually, my co-author uh, purchased a pair, and I'm waiting for mine to come in, that is entirely biodegradable, where when the sneakers break down, you can just grind it up and put it in your garden, the whole sneaker. See, I'm really excited by that. I'm so glad you mentioned that story because I read that in the book. I'm like, wow, that's incredible. It's made out of algae or something, right? Yeah, partially. There's the algae and then there's other materials in there. And there's actually a a T-shirt that I bought that was made from algae and they were using ink, like black ink made from certain types of algae as well because ink is really toxic. So there's a a lot of people experimenting with a lot of different – uh, technologies that are really amazing. That is really cool. And I got excited when I read that too. So 
uh, thank you for sharing that too. A lot of these innovations can be overwhelming for leaders in particular. So I've got two questions around this. Well, this one is a technical one. You have in the book, which I think is a great infographic, industry playlists. So basically you've, you've listed the, the industry. So for example, not-for-profits. And then underneath that, you have all the icons for the six to eight trends that are going to, you have selected as going to be hugely impactful for that industry. How could leaders use these playlists? It's one thing to say, oh, that's interesting to pay attention to that. But what then beyond that? Well, I'm glad I'm glad you asked because one of the things that was really important to us as authors, Henry and myself, was to make this book actionable instead of to make it theatrical. And by theatrical, I mean, oh, you read it and it's really interesting and you're inspired, but then you don't really know what to do. <laughs> you don't know what to do. And, and from a leadership point of view, you don't know what leadership lesson to take away. And instead of doing that, we put two things into the book that were intended to make it highly actionable. And the first one is exactly what you said, the industry playlists. So at the end of the book, we take the 30 trends and we say, if you're working in retail or financial services or healthcare or government or nonprofit or manufacturing or any one of these sectors, these are the 10 trends that you might want to start with to read first because they will give you a starting point into the book and they make the book a little bit more approachable than just saying, here's 30 trends, have fun. So it was meant to offer them a starting point through those trends. The second thing we did is at the end of every chapter, we asked these framing questions that were meant to inspire new thinking and to uh, help leaders to bring this into their organizations and decide on what to do next by framing the right questions. Because a lot of times when you're thinking about the future, when you're strategizing for the future, and it's been a long time doing business strategy as a consultant, it's all about the questions you ask. And if you ask the right questions to a smart group of people, they will come up with interesting solutions that drive you forward and become innovative and lead you towards the future. And as a leader, Oftentimes, your job is to ask the right questions. And one of the things we tried to do in the book was to inspire those sorts of questions by ge literally giving them to you. <laughs> you know, here are the things you should have. Here are the things you should be thinking about. That's brilliant. Thank you so much. And at the end of the interview, I'm going to dig out the book <laughs> and read out a couple of those questions, which would be awesome. So on leadership, what is the mindset, do you think, that leaders need to have in order to embrace doing this kind of work? Because it is edging into the unknown. There's no playbook necessarily about do this, that, then you know, step A, B, C, et cetera. It is about asking the questions and finding a way forward. So what is the mindset that we need? Well, the first thing is to perhaps shift the definition that we have of becoming, of being knowledgeable about something. Because right now, I think too many people feel like, you know, I've read about diving, so I know what it means to go diving. And then there's the other group of people who say, you know, I have to go diving. <laughs> I have to actually do this and be underwater myself in order to really understand it. And I think that the leaders that I see who are truly successful are the ones who are willing to try it for themselves as opposed to reading about it and feeling like, oh, I know that this is happening. ChatGPT is a perfect example. If you're a leader who's been reading about ChatGPT and the potential impacts of it, but you've never downloaded it or gone to the website and actually put in a prompt and tried it yourself, you are missing an opportunity to be knowledgeable. And you're not actually knowledgeable just by reading about it. That's not enough. And so the first challenge I would have for any leader is if you're going to understand something, you have to jump in and try it for yourself on a much deeper level. You can't just read about it. I love it. That's very good. And it's, I think you get over the hurdle of like, oh, it's going to be hard to adapt and learn all this thing. The way that this technology is being set up, and especially ChatGPT is a really good example. Once you it's just a search box. You just put your question there and it gives you an answer. <laughs> so you get past all the hurdles of, of trying to do it. That mid journey is a little bit more complicated. Yeah. And, and, and you, you know this because you've played with it, but here's the key. You can't just put in one question prompt, get the answer and you're done. The whole magic of it is that you put in the prompt, you get something back, then you tell it to refine it, then you get something else back, then you tell it to refine it again. You do that three or four times, then you start to see the real potential of this tool. Mm. 
That's right. And from a writing point of view, I absolutely did that with generating a blurb for my upcoming book. You know, I said, can you write a blurb? Of, this is the story, blah. So it did. And then I'm like, hmm, can you fine tune it with making it more dramatic, et cetera. <laughs> and so with a couple iterations, I ended up with something pretty good, which then I still edited myself to put my flavor on it in the end. But yeah, it saved me hours of angsting. <laughs> Coming up with it from the beginning. Well, we did the same thing when we needed to develop a script for a two-minute trailer video for the book. And uh, the resulting script is one that now I have with my video editor and, and we're working on developing into an actual video. And the script was written in 10 minutes with ChatGPT and it was done in a certain style. And the prompt that I started with is write me a script for a two-minute trailer in a Hollywood cinematic style. Awesome. <laughs> and then you fine-tuned it, right? Correct. Yeah. Then I said, you know, it didn't mention our names. So I just said, uh, I said the name of the book, but it didn't mention, it just guessed what it was about. Right. So then I said, <laughs> mention our names and mention this detail about us. Then I said, mention these couple of trends because I didn't give it any trends, but then I wanted it to mention them. Then I said, mention this tagline. And one of the taglines we've been using for the book is that it's a handbook for visionaries. And so I wanted that in the actual voiceover of the script. So I said, include this <laughs> very specifically. So then I had my tagline that I needed. And then I sped it up and said, make the cuts a little bit quicker. I said, use a visual of this because I knew a story from the book had, uh, there's a whole chapter about urban forests. And so we have biophilic skyscrapers, which are these, you've probably seen pictures. They're like a skyscraper that has lots of plants on every level. Yeah. Uh, so it's a very visual thing. So I wanted a picture of that. So I said, insert a video of that over here. Uh, and then we ended up with a script. Like that's how it went. I think it's a great example of how AI becomes a collaborator. It's not going to do all the work. It's a collaborative tool. And when it generates something, it prompts ideas. So you kind of iterate with it, which is which is perfect. So Along yeah, with, I mean, the, the thing that we used, um, I'm sorry, you want to move on? No, go, go. <laughs> I've got one other comment from you about yeah. AI stuff, and then I want to ask a, a values question. Okay, yeah. So, I mean, I was going to say the most impactful thing we did with AI for the book is we took a chapter, we fed it into AI, we asked it to write a one-star negative review of the chapter and identify the things that were gaps in the argument or things that weren't very good. And based on what it came up with, we could then go back and edit and address some of the things that we agreed were actually issues. And that was a really fascinating way to use the tool to get us to make the book better. And that's actually the chapter we wrote about, about AI was called Augmented Creativity. And it's exactly what you said, which is using AI as a collaborator. That is a really cool idea. <laughs> I'm just going to take that idea and apply it to my own work. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Um Values. So as leaders, there's a lot of upsides and downsides of the things that are occurring around us. What values do you think that we need as leaders to undertake working responsibly in, in the future? I think the first is to make sure that the people, the builders, the people who are creating this new thing for us, whether it's products or technologies, that they're considering the ethics of what they're producing. And when I say considering the ethics, it's partially about what could someone do with this in a negative way if we make it too easy for them to do that. And partially it's about the inclusiveness of it because a lot of things are developed from a certain perspective and, and they leave entire populations behind. They leave entire genders behind sometimes and they're just not thought about in a nuanced way. And by the way, they're not shown to anyone who's from any other group in order to get that perspective, to say, you know what, you're kind of missing this whole thing over here. So as leaders, we have to choose with intention to bring those perspectives in, either by hiring differently. I know that's challenging because sometimes you just can't add new people or it's just hard to find the right people. But I'll give you an example from the world of publishing because I own a book publishing company called Idea Press. And when we publish books to make sure that we have those perspectives, there's a certain type of editor you can hire in the world of publishing called a sensitivity reader. And a sensitivity reader is someone who reads your book, your manuscript, from the perspective that they come from, either as a disabled person or a person from a minority community. And they give you feedback on it based on their perspective and their lived experience. And what it allows you to do is this really magical thing as a writer – 
of having your work seen through a different perspective that you don't have. And it allows you to make your writing more inclusive and makes your examples more inclusive too. And and there's equivalence of that in many different industries, but a leader has to choose to prioritize that and say, we're going to save some budget to be able to pay for this thing. Not asking for a freebie from somebody who's a friend of someone who fits a certain group, right? This is hiring someone who is a professional who has this perspective, who can bring that to you to make your thing better. And I think that helps with avoiding cliches. So in the fiction writing world, it's it's having sensitivity readers and go, you know, you're really making this person sound, speaking to all these cliche tropes and really diminishing them as a result. So I think there's usefulness in that. The other, the other question I have around sensitivity readership is, do you believe that there's a danger of becoming too politically correct? And so that we... Uh, we buff off the edges of some conversations because of that. Yeah, I do. Uh, and and I would have to say, I mean, in all honesty, my time in Australia really showed me that. I mean, I lived in Sydney for five years and the metric for what is politically correct or allowable to say is different than Washington, D.C., which is a very politically correct city. And people's metrics are, are quite different with that. And so – I do think that there is a danger of feeling like you have to go so far that the writing becomes inauthentic and it becomes in inhuman and it feels like it's trying to please everyone by doing the thing that we we really dislike when, no offense to your husband but we really dislike when lawyers do this when we so some people say that you know one could believe that blah 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 and you're like come on have a perspective at least like don't just <laughs> don't just tell me that like that so i do think there is that that danger and the thing is with a sensitivity reader it's an editor typically and so what any editor will do is they'll make suggestions and then as an author or as a leader, it's your choice as to whether you want to act on that suggestion. It's just like consulting. You hire a consultant to give you advice and the advice might be good, but you don't always take it for whatever reason. So I do think there's some judgment involved there where – but knowing about it, right, is really important because one thing I realized – I mean my book Before the Future Normal, the book that I wrote – co-authored before that was called Beyond Diversity and it was all about – creating a more diverse and inclusive world. And one of the thing, lessons that I learned in writing that that stuck with me and will probably always stick with me is just because I don't find something offensive doesn't mean it isn't offensive. And I used to kind of apply my own thinking to like, well, that's not offensive because like, you know, I don't think it's that offensive. And that's not my call to make. I mean, if someone else is offended, then I should take that seriously if I'm going to be a person with high emotional intelligence and high integrity. And I should care about that as a writer because I'm not in the business of writing books that piss off half of the people who are reading them. That's not the type of book I want to write. And so when you put that lens on it, it sort of changes what you're willing to listen to because you become more uh, empathetic to other perspectives that you may or may not understand or agree with, but you at least take seriously because someone else has it. Mm, I think that's a useful perspective, point of view. And I think we also need to be mindful that we can run the risk of indulging too much in cancel culture as well, where people get shut down. Everything about them gets shut down because of a comment or an idea that they put forward. And I think there's a pendulum swing between that. So having said that, though, I think you're right to point out that the more we understand about each other's points of view – and have an awareness, understanding, and appreciation of that, um, the more empathetic and compassionate society we're going to build. A really great book just came out by Tim Urban called What's Wrong With Us? A, a playbook, a handbook? A handbook for societies? I'm not sure if it's handbook. <laughs> a self-help book for societies? <laughs> that's what it's called. And that's really good. And he points out the pendulum swing, uh, the progressive versus conservative polarity, and how we can go to extremes on both ends of that way. So that's a that's a really useful interpretation of some of these issues as well. So last question <laughs> to merge in this, well, second last question. Um, so we've looked at values, we looked at mindset. Does leadership need to change? And if so, how? 
Well, I think some leadership does need to change for sure. I would say that in general, <laughs> there are leaders who are in a position of leadership because they need to have their egos fed and not because they care about the people who they're leading. And those leaders and that mentality of leadership needs to uh, go away. If I could sort of wave a magic wand and have those types of leaders go away. And generally, the people who are led by them know, they know what the motivation is for those leaders. And honestly, they're usually men. Um, yeah, I, I think there could be female leaders who are in that category, but it's mostly men, let's be honest. And I think that those leaders are the ones that are, they lead through fear or through kind of domination first. That's their mentality. And we see a lot of them in politics. And the problem is that the people who are closest to them, the ones who work with them or who know them personally, never vote for them. But they're really good at manipulating the masses. And when you manipulate the masses and you get enough votes because people only latch on to that one little aspect of your personality and they don't really know you. They just know enough of, of what they see to think, oh, you know, that's the kind of leader that, that we want. And so those people stay in power. And, uh, and it's not just politics. It's also in the corporate entity. I mean, someone who is really good with the board and with the shareholders, but really a terrible leader, will oftentimes still be the leader of a publicly held company. And that's, uh, that's terrible. Yes, we can get rid of those narcissistic power mongers. Thanks. <laughs> we don't need them. <laughs> we don't need them to persist. Absolutely. So coming because most of our listeners are not narcissistic power mongers. No, they wouldn't be not if they're listening to, that's to right. you to this. Yeah. That's right. Uh, what habits are useful for leaders to start to adopt if they are going to be nimble and agile and ethical and inclusive as leaders. <laughs> That's a big call, right? Yeah. So what, what, what are some habits that we can put in place to stay on top of these trends and to implement them in an ethical, inclusive kind of way? I think one of the first things, I mean, there's a, there's an old cliche about how if you're driving down the road, anyone who's uh, driving faster than you is an asshole and anyone who's driving slower than you is a moron. And you're the only one who's like driving properly. <laughs> and I think the the leadership manifestation of that is to discount the opinions of those who are younger than you, to not appreciate those who have more experience than you. And I think that what great leaders manage to do is is first of all, listen to the young people and the new ideas that they have instead of killing that spirit by saying, well, we don't do things that way or all, any of the other ways that a leader might crush the new enthusiasm of someone who is younger. And at the same time, like we sort of see these people who are at the end of their careers and perhaps moving towards retirement, and we think, well, once they're out, they're gone. And what really successful leaders do is they create some sort of an alumni network. I mean, imagine if corporations did what universities do which is as soon as someone leaves the university, it's not like they're dead to the university. Now, all of a sudden, they're part of this alumni network. It's like a huge thing. And more companies should have alumni networks. Some do, but more of them should because there's huge value in these people who've spent their entire careers learning how to do something and building this level of knowledge. And then they retire and it's just gone. I mean, that's, that's sad for everyone. That's sad for the people who retire who are no longer able to access that part of their brain or use that part of their brain for something productive. And it's sad for the company that loses all of this institutional knowledge just because someone hits a certain age. I mean, that's one thing I would say for leaders, like appreciate both of those categories of people. That's really great. Thank you so much. That's, um, that's a wonderful idea. And I think you're right. Listening to young people takes a lot of patience and you do you have to take down all of your sc screens and filters and that and eye rolling <laughs> to go okay yeah. what's valuable in this point of view that we can really lean into and it's one of the reasons why i'm interviewing a young person coming up on the show shortly so instead of this us older wizened people though you don't have any gray <laughs> hair that i can see <laughs> um, i got gray in my beard a little bit oh like do you it's, okay it's starting okay it's starting. a little bit of wizened gray <laughs> We're going to talk to someone who has no gray. She's very young. And to get her perspective on leadership as well. Rohit, this has been really awesome. I love the book. I love the conversation. Where can people find out more about you and your work? 
So nonobvious.com is the entire platform where you can get access to a lot of different things. And as you know, I write a weekly newsletter, uh, which is just the most interesting stories of the week that I select. And then I publish that every Thursday US time. So in Australia, I think it's still late Thursday, but I think you still get it on Thursdays. And so if you want to have access to just things that I find fascinating every week, because I'm constantly reading and talking to people and traveling the world, speaking at events, subscribe to that. And it's just nonobvious.com slash subscribe. Fantastic. Rohit, thank you so much. This has been tremendous. <laughs> thank you. Thanks for the invitation. Well, that was totally fun. And as I mentioned in the interview, I've got... Rohit's book, The Future Normal, that he co-authored with Henri, uh, let me see, <laughs> Henri Kutenhu Mason, very difficult name, uh, Henri, and Rohit wrote this fabulous book. And as he mentioned, at the end of each chapter, they give leaders some questions to reflect on how to make the most of the chapter. So the two chapters he mentioned, one was Ending Loneliness. These are the three leadership questions that he includes. How can your business find more ways to bring intergenerational colleagues together to share experiences? Question number two, what other cultural gatherings or initiatives could be fostered besides cohabitation to enable more meaningful connections? And how could you reach out to people who are either younger than your generation or older to increase your intergenerational relationships outside of family? I think that's such a powerful issue to contend with. And it goes right along with what I'm writing and speaking about in terms of needing to build far more connection and interpersonal skills in the workplace to contend with what's coming. In the next chapter, this is all about virtual companionships. These are the three leadership questions they put forward. Number one, how could starting virtual relationships in your own life, either for therapy or just for friendship, help make you happier and improve your well-being. Well, I can tell you just from chatting with ChatGPT, it makes life feel less lonely. <laughs> like you've got somebody who's riding shotgun to you that can help you out. So that's just a little insight for me. Second question is, what new interpersonal skills would we all need to learn to effectively navigate an online world filled with a mix of real and virtual people? Mm. And number three, as we build more relationships with virtual companions, what responsibility do their creators have to keep them alive and available? And how will we emotionally deal with their deactivation or digital death? Yes, there is, uh, I just read Becky Chambers' book, A Long Way from a Small Angry Planet. And in that book, there is a death of an AI and they need to reboot the AI and all of the characteristics and persona and personality they developed over years of interacting with humans disappears. And so that AI persona disappears. And they are mourned by, in particular, by one of the crew had fallen in love with her and developed an emotional relationship with her. And I think this is real. It's, it's not just a story in a book. These We are going to build relationships and dependencies and interdependencies with these virtual companions and that's going to change how we show up and how we look after our virtual assets and programs. Okay, plenty to think about on this show this week. Next week, as promised, we have an interview with a young person. Her name is Iman Kibukumasoki. She is my niece. She is a fabulous human with lots going on. And I really look forward to sharing her insights on life work and leadership from a younger generation, Gen Z, a Gen Z point of view on the show. So that's what's coming up next on the show. If you want to take any of these ideas further, what I do with teams and leaders is I work on your strategy, your strategic thinking, and your culture and how your culture is fit for purpose for the future. If you're interested in either of those things, me working with you and your team, big thinkers with big hearts who want to make a big difference, then I would love to chat. Feel free to reach out at zoe at zoerouth.com and we can start a conversation, see what you're focused on, see where you want to go and how I might assist you in carving out the future that you want to live into. In the meantime, live well, lead well. You've been listening to the Zoe Routh Leadership Podcast. To find out more about leadership of the future or to contact Zoe, 
go to zoeralph.com. 